Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us on Fox 9 Local for a special election day coverage. I'm Amy Hockert. And I'm Randy Meyer. Polls have just closed here in Minnesota. It's straight up 8 o'clock. Joining us tonight, Hamlin University Professor David Schultz. David, thanks for coming. We My appreciate it. My your, pleasure. Your insight is invaluable on nights like oh, yeah. this, so we appreciate you being there. Yeah. Thank you. The ballot may not say president, may not say governor, but make no mistake, there are some very important elections going on today that will impact local communities. And we're going to highlight a few of them as part of our coverage. And we want to just get right into this and starting with Minneapolis City Council. These voters will be deciding all three of the council seats and they'll be determined by ranked choice voting. So these results may not come in very quickly tonight. Be patient with us on those. With all the seats online, 13 of them, the council could look a lot different. In Ward 7, for example, which includes parts of downtown council member <laughs> Lisa Goodman is not seeking another term. The same for Ward 12, which is southeastern Minneapolis. Andrew Johnson, well, he took another job and is not running, so that seat will have a new face as well. Yeah, and we want to also take a look at Ward 2. So this is the area that includes Cedar Riverside, Marcy Homes, and the Prospect Park neighborhood. You have Robin Wansley running here unopposed. She has been an outspoken critic of Mayor Jacob Fry. She was the lone no vote on that newly appointed Community Safety Commissioner. So somebody who's not afraid uh, to stand up there uh, and be the contrarian in that scenario. And then in Ward 8, Council President Andrea Jenkins is fighting to keep her seat. Uh, Jenkins challenged there by three other candidates. So we want to pause here and bring in David because we've had a lot of focus on the Minneapolis City right. Council. Uh, you know, there have been clashes with the mayor. We talked about Robin Wansley there. There is going to be some turnover here. How do you see this sort of, it's not really a balance of power shift because it's a very democratic uh, council, but how do you see that playing out as we move forward? You're right. I mean, Minneapolis has become, at least in theory, a one-party town, but a one-party divided with a series of factions at this point. And we can maybe, in the most crude way, look at it is that there's sort of the progressive wing of the Democratic Party and the more progressive wing of the Democratic yeah. Party. And Andrea Jenkins' race, I think, is really fascinating as kind of a bellwether. Any other city in the country, she, she represents the far left. But in Minneapolis, she's identified as, as sort of the moderate status quo. And, and depending on what happens with her race, I think it tells us whether or not the more progressive wing gets the nine votes. Nine is critical mm -hmm. because if they get nine, they get to override Jacob Fry's veto, who's viewed as also what? A moderate, moderate. Um, compared, compared to some of the others. And this is big. Remember, two years ago in Minneapolis, there was a ballot proposition that shifted Minneapolis from what's called a weak mayor to a strong mayor system, giving the mayor more control over a lot of things. If the more progressive wing gets these nine votes, what they're going to be able to do at this point is override his veto and on critical issues such mm. as police funding, public safety, rent control, zoning, a whole bunch of things. So this, this is the race that I and most of us are looking at at this point in terms of telling us what possibly could happen in Minneapolis. And I'm interested, David, in terms yeah. of the makeup of the city itself, those voting, right? either in a, a, a non-election. Right. Uh, do, does that progressive wing, that ever-growing progressive wing, represent the residents of Minneapolis well? In other words, is yeah. that the right makeup? Yeah, that's actually a really good question here. Again, first off, it is a city that is moving progressively more to the left over time, or at least looks like it is. You know, we're looking at Jacob Fry, who's to the left of S.D. Hodges, who was to the left of my, Rybeck a few years ago. So it's been moving. But when we're looking at potentially a turnout of maybe only 25% of the vote, maybe, maybe 30, I don't know where it's gonna be here at this point, and when we're looking at a city where the Democratic caucuses really decide just about mm -hmm. everything at this point, there still is a chunk of Minneapolis that's that's not to the left, that's more center. There's still There still are Republicans, believe it or not. There are still Republicans in that city. And it's not clear that this council overall really represents the diversity of viewpoints. Mm -hmm. What it does represent are the activists who get out for the caucuses, for the early voting, for the conventions. And, and that's the concern with, again, a low turnout, that it favors the activists. Yeah. We're watching it closely here, but uh, people across the country have been watching Minneapolis and the city government and the way that it's been operating, uh, primarily since the murder of George Floyd, right? A lot of eyes on this. Exactly, yeah. 
the murder of George Floyd really put Minneapolis into the center of American politics about issues of policing and race. But there are other issues also that are important. Minneapolis is also important in terms of questions about rent control. Um, there's a debate there about zoning policy, about, a, about it, local initiatives on the environment. A quick story I say is that is about a week ago, there's a magazine called Governing, which is kind of sort of the insider magazine for state and local officials. And they called me and they said, our readers are interested in what's happening in Minneapolis. And I'm getting calls from, let's say, more of these, these, kind, of these kind of magazines or, or bulletins across the country. They're following what's happening. So it's not just that we care here. Yeah. The eyes are really on Minneapolis. Interesting. Right. Also, we are keeping an eye on St. Paul tonight. All seven city council seats there are on the ballot mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, in fact, four of those seats are entirely open. So the St. Paul City Council will certainly look a lot different after this election as well. St. Paul also uses ranked choice voting, which can get a little sort of odd for some people. Remember, it's the top two vote getters. And uh, anyway, it gets complicated. We'll talk about that. Yeah. Ward one alone has several candidates seeking that seat. Council President Amy Brennan-Moen is among those who are not seeking a new term. So Ward five is up for grabs. The council's guaranteed to have a majority of new members since only three incumbents, as Amy said, are running. Mm. David, we know for sure that the city council will look different. It'll Correct. have new members. Correct. What do you make of, of sort of a, a full scale change in a city council? Um, does it say something about how the public feels about the direction of the city? Is it just a cycle thing? Now we're in two year cycle because sure. of the odd number. Right. What does it say? A little bit of cycling, but I think it also reflects again in a different way, the division that's in St. Paul. And if we look at some of the critical votes that have happened recently, let's say on issues such as, you know, marijuana and so forth in the city, a lot of the people who are leaving have been on what? The losing side of four, three votes at this Leaving point. the city council. Leaving the city yeah. council. And I think what they're kind of looking at is saying, life is kind of short. It's not fun being in the minority. And, and, and they're moving on to do other things. So this, again, this reflects also a shift in St. Paul politics. Maybe not as dramatic as, as Minneapolis, but the fact that we're seeing this, this, this change in composition, mm -hmm. um, St. Paul's politics as well as its demographics are, are, are really rapidly changing. I mean, St. Paul is the largest majority non-white um, um, city in, 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 um, in Minnesota now, and one of the larger in the United States. And, and that shift in demographics yeah. is bringing with it different shifts in power dynamics. Right. Okay, well, for more on these city council races, we do want to bring in our, our Maury Glover. He is live for us tonight. So Maury, uh, what have you got for us here on these races in both Minneapolis and St. Paul? Well, voters in both cities are taking part in elections, city council elections that will decide which direction their city takes for years to come. I am most concerned about uh, the environment um, environmental justice and uh, police accountability. In Minneapolis, all 13 seats in the city council are on the ballot, and the outcome of just a few of those races could have an effect on Mayor Jacob Fry. Right now, Fry tends to hold a narrow majority on many issues, but this election could determine if there are enough progressives on the council to override a mayoral veto, potentially making it more difficult for Fry to move his agenda forward. I will say, that I wish to see a more left-leaning city council. I think that a lot of the times, um, Mayor Frey's vetoes are not in the direction I'd like them to be, specifically when it comes to what happened on Hennepin Avenue with dedicated bus lanes. Council President Andrea Jenkins is facing a stiff challenge from Soren Stevenson, who says she isn't liberal enough. In all, five candidates for city council are endorsed by the Democratic Socialists of America, who want the council to become more progressive as it deals with issues like homeless encampments, city shoveled sidewalks, and police reform. I would like a more moderate city council. I think we've tacked a little too far to the left, so striking more of a middle balance and being much more pragmatic about the approach we're taking around a whole host of issues. Over in St. Paul, four of the seven council members are stepping down, making it the highest turnover on the city council since the 1990s. If a certain combination of candidates are elected, the entire council could be women under 40, with a majority of them being women of color, with new members tackling issues like crime and rent control. I think it's great. I love seeing more women in politics, and I'm glad to see um, different races represented. It's a good thing. I think, you know, we don't have a lot of representation in other areas. So seeing it here, especially in St. Paul, is really important to me. 
Um, love, I would love to see that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so for me, it was really important to show up and vote for some of those, yeah. Now, both cities have ranked choice voting, as you guys have mentioned, so uh, it could be a while before we get results, but the people we talked with say they will be watching those results with bated breath. Reporting live in Minneapolis, Maury Glover, Fox 9. All right, Maury, thank you. That's good insight. Uh, a lot of things that will be discussed tonight have to do with your money. In addition to the big city council races we've mentioned, some cities will be asking residents to increase the sales tax. And we're talking about some of the suburbs, Golden Valley, Edina, Bloomington, uh, Moundsview. They all have these questions on the ballot, but we do want to start with our state's second largest city in St. Paul. Voters mm -hmm. there asked to approve a 1% sales tax increase, and this would fund some pretty big improvements for streets, bridges, parks. So we're talking about infrastructure here. If the voters say yes, by the way, St. Paul would have the highest sales tax rate in the state, just under 10%. Uh, we want to bring David back in. This would give the city sure. almost a billion dollars to work with over the next 20 years. Correct. Are people tired of opening up their wallets at this point because of inflation and all these other costs are going up? How do they feel when the city comes to them and says, by the way, we need about a billion dollars? That's going to be the good question for tonight, because also we're looking in St. Paul that there was a double digit increase in property taxes mm -hmm. in the last year. And you're right, all about the inflation factor at this point. And you have to wonder at this point, at some point, do the people say, I'm paying enough at this point, and is there going to be a pushback? And even if it does pass, even if it does pass at this point, and, 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 and it could, I, I'm, I'm hearing rumors that it might pass, you have to wonder what is the impact, let's say, in terms of businesses or consumers? Will consumers seeing a, a sales tax, perhaps of 10%, now say, you know, I can go to Roseville. I can, I can go, I don't know, to... Um, somewhere else and, and go buy my you know my goods or something like that we don't know but we certainly know that last year's election inflation was a big issue mm. and everybody I mean everybody who's watching here today you go to the grocery store you see the price of milk the price mm -hmm. of eggs going up yeah. and you wonder okay can I can I take any more I think to that point too David I saw a statistic today that 61 or 2 percent of the revenue brought in from a sales tax increase like the one St. Paul's asking comes from outside the city from yes. people who come in to purchase inside the city limits. I think you're right in that making a decision to go into St. Paul to shop would come into play at a 10 percent sales tax I think for a lot of people. It would and also given the fact that St. Paul has tried to recast its economy in the last few years to be tourism mm -hmm. you know we've got We've got the hockey, we've got all the restaurants, we have a lot of sort of really kind of tourism amenities. And does this kind of give people a second thought yep. to say, I'm not going to come in mm -hmm. and go to a restaurant in St. Paul? We're going to talk about some of the other sales tax asks in Golden Valley, Moundsview, uh, Bloomington, among right. others. But first, we want to talk about this ask in St. Paul. This money, the goal here would be to uh, improve roads and parks, some of that infrastructure there. We sent Bab Santos into St. Paul to sort of talk to the people to see what they were getting with more on what voters are feeling and what they're being asked to do and what the money raised would actually address in the city. Bab Santos joins us now with that. Babs? Yeah, polling places have now closed obviously in the last 10 minutes or so, but earlier this afternoon we went to several polling places, both here in St. Paul and over in Gold, Golden Valley to talk with voters about these questions on the ballot that are getting so much of our attention tonight. Both St. Paul and Golden Valley are asking residents again to vote on sales tax hikes that would finance significant improvements to city infrastructure. Here in St. Paul, the city wants that one percentage point sales tax increase over 20 years to finance about $1 billion in road work and improvements to local parks. But also, Golden Valley is looking for a 1.25 percentage point increase over 30 years to pay $15 million for land, $45 million to build a public works building on that land, and another $45 million for a separate police and fire headquarters. Talking with voters in both cities today, people really seem split on these issues. And I see a lot of rich people not paying taxes, and me as a poor person, I don't even receive my taxes. They take everything from me, so I do not agree with the tax increase at all, in any tax increase, because nothing ever comes back to me. I think that if I'm not willing to give, contribute 1%, then I can't expect that to come from anywhere else. I think my participation. 
tonight similar questions concerning a health and wellness center county jail and swimming pool were also on the ballot in bloomington marshall and Beltrami county just to name a few so we're really seeing this across the state it'll be very interesting to see how it all plays out or if they people say enough is enough and they vote no live for now tonight in st paul bev santos Fox 9. All right, Babs, thank you. You heard Babs mention Golden Valley, a first ring suburb of Minneapolis. Right. Voters there, as he said, being asked questions related to sales tax increase, I think 1.25% was mm -hmm. the number. That would give the city, as Babs said, $45 million for a new public works building, another $45 million for a new police and uh, fire headquarters in that city as well. Two pretty significant asks correct. for two pretty significant buildings. Yeah. Yes, absolutely correct at this point. And there may be a need for this, but again, going back to our conversation before, is there sort of a fatigue? Is there sort of a sense at this point that, that there's a lot of needs, but, but also regular consumers, regular taxpayers, people are kind of being pushed at this point. And the one woman who was being interviewed there and talking about saying about comments about rich people and so forth, uh, one of the things to remember about sales taxes like that, these are regressive. They fall more heavily upon um, people of, of lesser means as right. opposed mm -hmm. to the rich. And so to what extent are cities now shifting over um, to people of more modest means to finance a lot of their projects? Do you think people will be more likely to fund projects like parks and, and, and roads as opposed to, say, sports complexes? Is that playing into their minds at all? Perhaps, perhaps. One of the things that we've learned over the years, by the way, also, if, if you tell people specifically how the money's going to be spent mm -hmm. and say, this is what it is, they make better decisions. If you just say, I'm gonna raise your taxes, unequivocally opposed to it. Um, but there's some evidence, if you can earmark and say, this is what's the before, but yes, what we're seeing is a push, increased pushback um, against, let us say, sports complexes, but parks um, and let's say um, roads, especially, people seem more supportive of. But we again, we shouldn't forget the fact that we have a lot of school bond referenda also right. yes. that are out there, and the the politics of, of the schools this year is fascinating because you've got the teachers unions who are pushing on the one direction. You also have all these parental groups out there who are pushing for control in terms of curriculum. And again, we're we've got to dig these, into that. We want yeah. to. Yeah. yeah, a little bit yeah. later, we're going to dig into yeah. that because that's a big issue for a lot of people yeah. who may be outside the the, uh, the heart of St. Paul. And exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So before we move on, so let's let's just give folks a rundown of some of the the different uh, ballot questions we're going to be watching tonight. So St. Paul wanting these uh, better roads and these parks, Golden Valley, a new police station and fire station, and then Bloomington again. This half percent sales tax increase for this Bloomington Ice Garden. It is the state of hockey, so we'll see how this goes. <laughs> and then similar requests on the ballot in Edina. Uh, they're trying to expand the Braemar Arena in Edina. All right, so how about let's go up north and let's talk about what uh, we think is the biggest mayoral race that we want to talk about tonight, right? Yeah, the folks up in Duluth are looking at a highly competitive race with lots of money going into this contest. Some background here. Mayor Emily Larson is seeking a third term up there, but she's facing a tough test from former state senator Roger Reinert. Both are Democrats. Reinert, and this is where it gets weird, Reinert dominated in the primary, winning 63 to 35 percent, yet the two will still see each other in this election. Right. Advancing to the general, so Larson got another shot at the office today in the voting. David, primaries are one thing, right. general elections are another thing, right. but Larson got thumped in that primary. Yeah. Is it likely that a turnaround in a general can replace 30 some percentage points that you saw a difference in the primary? Unlikely, never want to say never, want to right. say never, because we've, we've seen massive reversals over time. But at this point, unless for some reason lulled into overconfidence in terms of her base saying, all right, we don't need to show up, it's pretty unlikely things are gonna shift at this point. And again, from what I've been sort of following in terms of Duluth at this point, uh, She's doing a pretty good job in terms of, you know, you know, bringing out, bringing out her troops at this point. What went wrong with with her getting just absolutely pummeled yeah. uh, as the incumbent? What went wrong? Well, again, it might be a little bit of complacency. I, th mm. I think I think we see that oftentimes that incumbents running think they have it wrapped up. They have it wrapped up, and they don't campaign as hard. I think that's one of them. But also, you get to a third term. I don't want to quite say that, two, well, people give you two terms. By the time you get to a third term, yeah. there's a little bit of, what, candidate fatigue at this sure. point. Yeah, you've, you've, you've kind of done your eight years or whatever. Yeah. Let's give somebody else yeah. a chance. And so even though I think she's, she's done her best, I think the, uh, the opposition, you know, 
maybe it's the fresh blood, maybe it's sort of a new set of ideas, but certainly I think what we're seeing, maybe in part up there, is, is really people asking for um, a different direction for the city. Okay. All right, we are looking at another mayoral race. So we're keeping an eye on one in St. Louis Park where some history could possibly be made today. And we've been talking about Council Member Nadia Mohammed uh, trying to become the first Somali American elected as mayor. So at 23 years old, she was already the youngest council member in St. Louis Park. We covered her back then, and now she's 27. She's hoping to become mayor. The veteran. Yes, yeah, she, well, she <laughs> faces a retired banker here in Dale Larson. She's 27, but she actually has more political experience than her opponent, who's, who's retired, you know, in his 50s or 60s. So. Uh, uh, what do you make of uh, what do you make of this? Well, this is a transition that's going on across Minnesota. You know, we we really have become a a, a metro area of immigrants, and we, we really are get are, are changing pretty significantly. And what we're seeing over the last few years is the Somali. You know, let's say in, in St. Paul, we're seeing let's say the Hmong, but we're really seeing now. Um, almost a generational shift going on in terms of, of new faces, new Minnesotans really changing the landscape. And I think she's sort of one of those examples at this point. And you're right, she's, she's, she's mobilized one council. She's got a lot of support at this point. And I think her base is very excited mm -hmm. about her. Yeah. All right, uh, let's switch gears just a little bit here, David. We want to talk about what is on a lot of people's ballots today, uh, school board races. Yes. There's a good chance that your school board race is heated. Yeah, we're yeah. seeing a trend of school board candidates being endorsed by organizations. David, you mentioned that earlier. W often partisan organizations such as parental rights groups have cropped up in some of these races. Fox 9's Rose Schmidt is live in M Minnetonka tonight to explain how this has sort of shifted over time, Rose. Yeah, well, political experts tell us spending in school board races is up 50% from two years ago, almost $350,000 at last check. And in some Minnesota cities, these races are the main attractions, the ones driving voters to the polls today. School board elections used to be a sleepy affair, usually pretty nonpartisan. You'd have to kind of hustle to get the good people in the neighborhood to volunteer. That's not the case anymore, says University of Minnesota Professor of Politics Larry Jacobs. Statewide, there are about 200 candidates running for 100 positions, and several of the races are heated. They're over the culture wars, uh, race, LGBTQ identity. Um, we're talking about book banning, uh, parent rights. It's the full spectrum of things that get people really angry. School board races are nonpartisan, but the candidates are increasingly being endorsed by organizations that skew conservative or liberal. The Minnesota School Boards Association says this trend coincided with the pandemic as children were distance learning. Many who are interested in running for school board seat saw firsthand um, what are some, what's going on in our public schools and it may be an opportunity to change this or question the process. Political experts also say state and national organizations have gotten involved in recruiting candidates. The momentum in large part spurred by the parents' rights movement that blossomed in Virginia and other states. Here in Minnesota, if elected, these candidates' main responsibilities will be hiring a superintendent, establishing a budget, and adopting policies that reflect their community's values. If our school board is constantly disagreeing on issues, um, whether it's discipline or curriculum, um, and they can't move forward, that has a way to impact um, what, what our teachers and our students and our community as well. The School Boards Association also noting that in an odd year election, candidates know that these margins are slimmer, so that means they have to campaign harder. Reporting live in Minnetonka, Roe Schmidt, Fox 9. All right, David, I want to get your take on this because sure. um, it used to be, as pointed out in that piece and as pointed right. out by you earlier, that school boards used to be a place where the average person, sometimes just a neighborhood leader, could go and have an impact on the education process, right? Now it is very political. Right. Groups of people, three, four, saying we're running together essentially so we would have a dominant force on a school board. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to escape the political trappings of what is typically seen at a national or state level now all the way down into a school board. I don't see it at this point because you're right, we're essentially seeing the polarization at the presidential and the congressional really has worked its way down. I used to say at one point that what happens at the national level isn't gonna affect 
local campaigns, but the divide is, is so significant that it's, it's really driving just about every issue. And the school boards now have become, in the last year, really sort of the new sort of, let's say, cleavage or fissure point for a lot of American politics. Mm -hmm. All right. Keep that in mind when you run for school board. That's right. right? I don't know who would want to run, frankly, <laughs> yeah. looking at the, the you know, yeah. yeah. All right, All right let's uh, take a step back and look at a couple national races we'll be watching tonight. Yeah, let's start out in Ohio. Uh, voters there have passed a constitutional amendment, and this guarantees an individual right to abortion. A lot of eyes on this ballot question. This uh, got on the ballot after a reproductive rights group reportedly received more than 700,000 signatures, which was well above and beyond the 413,000 that they needed to even get that question on the ballot. And we'll talk in a minute about uh, how this might be a bellwether mm -hmm. moving forward with David. Let's take a look at the state of Kentucky where Governor Andy Beshear, a Democrat, has held on to his seat in a state where Donald Trump won in 2020. He faced Daniel Cameron, Kentucky's attorney general, who became the first Republican to hold that office since 1948. Cameron has faced some criticism over the investigation that brought no charges against any of the Louisville police officers in the deadly shooting of Breonna Taylor. All right, we are also keeping an eye on Virginia tonight. So voters there are going to decide whether they're going to give Republicans full state government control. So they already have, uh, Republicans already have control of the House and then the governor's seat there. All 140 seats in that legislature, 140 are up for grabs. And that outcome is important because uh, just four states have these legislative elections this year. So uh, David, I guess we'll kind of dive into these races tonight and how they might play into 2024. But if there is this red wave in Virginia, you know, tonight, what does that tell us looking ahead to next year's election? Well, I'm, I'm always hesitant to sort of generalize from any one race, especially a year out to the next one, but it might be telling us something very important first about Virginia, that this is a state that was solidly Republican a generation ago and has swung Democrat, and now it appears to be kind of swinging back again and becoming more of a swing state again. And, and and, and what I think Republicans are going to want to look to, su to see here is what were the themes, what were the issues that Republicans were talking about, and maybe look at those as talking points. And especially if I can juxtapose this to, to Ohio at this yes. point, yeah. because Ohio is now interesting. Since the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade and the guarantee for abortion rights in the Constitution, every single ballot initiative that has dealt with abortion, the voters have come in and said, we support abortion rights in some way, shape, or form. And this is posing a problem for the Republicans. So maybe, maybe in Virginia, there's something that the Republicans can, can learn in terms of how to talk yeah. about issues. But there's no question that now, if I could also bring in Kentucky, yeah. a state that, that is otherwise strongly Donald Trump, mm -hmm. A Democrat prevails. So, at the, so assuming all these trends go the way they are, both parties are going to see something in Ohio, Virginia, and in Kentucky in terms of setting up their narratives, their stories for how they're going to campaign in 2024. So any one state, no, but take these three states together, we start to get a picture mm -hmm. of the complexity of the 2024 election. You mentioned complexity of the 2024 election. Nothing is more complex right now in the, in the eyes and minds of voters than the presidential end Correct. of this. We've got an aging incumbent in, in, in Biden. Right. Many Democrats have openly said he's too old to run, he shouldn't run, somebody else should step up. And then you've got Donald Trump, who's the Republican front runner at this point, who is facing several legal challenges Correct. that could put him in a very unusual predicament between yeah. now and November next year. How do you see, and I'm so excited to pick your brain on this yeah. because it's being batted around every day right. on the political scene. How do you see this thing unfolding? It seems like a no win for both parties as it stands right now. You're absolutely correct. I mean, at this point, depending on the polls, 60% if not plus of the American public says they're not thrilled about this lineup. Uh, the way I've been saying it to in my students is saying that the American public is saying, 50 governors, 100 senators, 435 House members, can't we get a better set of choices than this? And, but we're not going to. Unless something happens, we are on a collision course um, with two candidates who are not popular in terms of overall uh, American public, and we're also into an area that we've never seen before. The what ifs of what if Donald Trump is convicted, what does it mean? What if? And, and you, you never hope this will happen, of course, but, but given Biden's age and so forth, uh, what if he has a health problem? Mm -hmm. What if something happens, he's incapacitated, yeah. going into the campaign? Or what if both of them get the nominations, there's a conviction